All right, we're on page five. This halakha is probably going to be the hardest one to hear. Last week's was that was not the Torah. Yeah. That you know, we're required to learn day and night. But then we, when we learn different opinions, that you say the Shema. So we finished that yesterday. Time. Was that the yeah. same? And then you said that would be very difficult. Same, same time. So this is more set difficult. Time. Set time. Set time. Try. Right. But, but you'll be impressed at how relevant this is here. Seder Hanimud. The proper order of study. La Kovea to the one who establishes Itim la Torah, set times to study Torah. So, what's the proper order in which a person should study Torah? What should they study? What's the preference? I have an hour a day, I have five hours a day. What do I start with? Five, the line right above the, the chapter title. The, 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 oh, okay. In the book. Okay, sorry. Baalei Batim. Baal Batim. Householders. They live with people who own houses. That means laymen. People that are, are not necessarily full time Torah scholars. Sheinami Cholim, who are unable. La Sok Batoa, to study Torah. Kol Hayom, all day long. The Kovim Itim, and they set times to study Torah. How much does a simple layman study Torah? Bemeshech, for the duration of Shatayim or Shaloshot, two or three hours, the whole Yom, every day. So a balabayit is somebody who has two or three hours a day set aside to study Torah, uninterrupted. Ra'u'i <coughs> lahem, it's proper for them, shiyakdishu et zman limudam, shiyakdishu, that they should dedicate et zman, the time of limudam, their learning, Not just the halakha, because there are many parts of halakha, but practical halakha, relevant halakha. Like the things we study here. You could sit here and we could discuss the laws of checking your clothes for shatness for two years. <laughs> this is not relevant, really. From the shukhan aruch, the nosei kelav. Nosei kelav literally means, you know when... Uh, Yonatan, who knows Tanakh here well? Yonatan goes out, Shaul goes out, to shoot his arrows. Who's going out to shoot his arrows? David, David. He catches no, the arrows. Yonatan, 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 Yonatan goes to shoot his arrows. And he kills who? There's another man going with him. Who's he? His servant. What is he doing? What's his job? To go to either catch pass the arrow or catch it. So no second he's literally the weapons bearer. He's the one who holds the bow and arrow and catches the arrows and goes to bring the arrows. He's the one who's responsible for making sure that this person is on target. We call the commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch the Nosei Kelim, the weapon bearers. Hmm. They're the ones who hold all the ammo, they hold all the, they're the ones who guide us into understanding what the Shulchan Aruch actually meant. So we would translate the term as commentaries. But really, it means much more than that. It, it's we're giving a lot of respect. These are the people who carry Rabbi Yosef Cairo's weapons, even though they didn't live in the same time. Correct. So one should set their time to study Shulchan Aruch with the commentaries. Oh, or mitoch divrei raboteinu haposkim, or other books from the writings of our rabbis, the poskim, the halachic authorities. 
אשר מפיהם אנחנו חיים. Because we live from their mouths, meaning we live by their words, their guidance. Why, why is it important for a Balabayit to study words of Halakha? Today, in order, sheyadu la'asot, they should know how to act, ma'asahim, in their actions, kedadu chedin, halakhali, properly. If I want to observe Shabbat properly, if I want to do business properly, I have to learn this somewhere. I can't just, it's not intuitive. You learn it somewhere, so it's important to set time to study these things. V'loi kashlu chas v'shalom. And they should not stumble, God forbid. Bi'isurim, in prohibitions, habayim, which are caused, machamat choser yidiyat halacha. Because of a lack of knowledge of halacha. Choser, a lack yidiyat of knowledge of halacha. There are many things that people do wrong because they don't know the halacha. They're not familiar with the halacha. a great example. You just had steak for dinner. It's an hour later. You're walking with your children on the boardwalk somewhere nice. Give it a La Jolla. You see an ice cream stand. You're excited because it has a hechshar in it. So you buy your child a scoop of ice cream and you, before you give it that, I want to take a taste. And you say, I had a steak an hour ago. <laughs> they don't say that. What do you do? Oh, my tongue. Did you eat it yet? No, you didn't eat it yet. You made the blessing already. In vain. So most people tell you, just say, Baruch Hashem, Kevod, Machuton, Lulamvet. There's a magical formula that cancels out your blessing. So let's say this. If you made a shakol and and you discovered the steak you were about to eat was really pig, so you don't you don't need a piece of pig because you need a piece of uh, something else. Of it's better. It's yeah. better. Than, you're at the ice cream stand. What are you gonna uh, 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 water? You already made a half sick. You already interrupted to the name of that. Also, when you make a blessing on something, you should have in mind when you make the blessing what you're blessing on. That's why we announced the night of the Omer before. Why do I have to announce it? You're gonna find out when I count anyways. Because when you make the blessing, you have to know what you're making a blessing on. Ideally. So if you find out it's a piece of pig, you say shakol, you don't eat it because it's not, it's not kosher, it doesn't make a difference. There's no blessing in vain on a non-kosher food. But the prohibition of eating meat after dairy, dairy after meat, is very weak. And we do it, it's a custom. It's mentioned Shukhan Aruch in the But it's not a, it's not a biblical halakha. It's not even a rabbinic halakha. It's a halakha that was incorporated by the rabbi. It takes silver to digest. It takes longer for meat to digest. Minimum. So wait. So this is my one area, obviously, I'm not familiar with. But uh, so if you have meat after milk, it's worse than having milk after meat. No. No. I'm confused. Let me explain. Hashem says, "Do not cook a goat in its mother's milk." The rabbi explained. It says this three times to teach you. You cannot eat meat and milk together. You cannot cook <coughs> meat and milk together. And you cannot derive benefit from meat and milk which are cooked together. So you can't make it and sell it to somebody for money. A rabbi then say, what does it mean you can't eat meat and milk together? What is the definition of together? <laughs> it says, uh, take this medication with food. What does with food mean? You have to eat your, your food and eat it at the same time, or is it in 10 minutes proxy? What is with? Our rabbis don't like vague terms, so they try to define these terms. So the rabbis in the Talmud, one of them is famous as saying, I am not as holy as my father. My father used to wait 24 hours between meat and milk, and I only wash my mouth out between meat and milk. And from here you see that there's two extremes on how long you have to wait. I'm giving you an entire smicha course in three minutes. Listen carefully. <laughs> Rashi and the Rambam have an argument about why we wait after meat. Because what's the problem? I mean, you can't eat it together, but one after the other, what's the big deal? So Rambam says it's because of the food that is stuck in between your teeth. You eat meat, you got little stringy pieces between your teeth. So according to the Rambam, if you would brush your teeth and floss them well, would you be able to have dairy? 
Yes. Absolutely. Very good. Absolutely. Which is what that rabbi in the Talmud is saying. I, I just wash my mouth up. What Rashi says is no, there's. It's, um, forgive me for saying. But people burp up flavor of the food that they eat. And so long as that burping up still happens, then then uh, you can have dairy. Yeah, now, another point is is it in the mixing in the mouth or mixing in the stomach? Everything mixes in the stomach. Okay, but the stomach yeah. food lasts longer. <clears throat> Correct, so it's not the stomach. But it's this burping up that comes from the stomcha. It is the stomach, but it's not. we're not worried that it's mixing here, we're worried that it's mixing it's coming up. there. As and so, up. so Rashi, according to him, where would he be lenient mm. and the Rambam is strict? I mean, we know where the Rambam is lenient. The Rambam says if you floss your teeth, that doesn't work for Rashi. Flossing your teeth doesn't help you with your burps. So what, what helps, right, what's, what's lenient in Rashi that the Rambam wouldn't agree to? What if you chew your food for a child? You don't eat it. You're just chewing it up so they can eat it. This is the thing people used to do. People might still do it. I, I can't. But you see your child wants a piece of chicken, but it's too, it's too hard of it, so you chew it, and then you take it out and give it them to eat. So now, according to the Rambam, it's also the enzyme there's still meat in your mouth. Mm-hmm. According to Rashi, if you cleaned out your mouth, you had a glass of water, you did something, there's nothing in your stomach, you can have dairy right away. So what did the Halakha say? We're strict like both opinions. <laughs> kind of like We're strict like both opinions. It doesn't make a difference if you floss, it doesn't make a difference if you didn't swallow. Either way, once it goes into your mouth, you're done. That's over. You have to wait. How long do you wait? You see 24 hours, and you see <laughs> two minutes. Hours. So what do you see? The Rambam, he invented this number of six hours. The Rambam mm-hmm. said that according to his calculations, six hours is enough time that even if you were to have meat in between your teeth, it would lose its flavor. Don't try it. If you ever found meat in between your teeth after six hours, take it out and taste it. <laughs> and according to the Rambam, it wouldn't taste like meat anymore. I know, never bothered to try. <laughs> That's where we got the number six hours. And Maran in the Shulchan Aruch rules that one must wait six hours between meat and milk. Because that's what the Rambam said, because we follow the Rambam. Along comes the Rambam. And the Rambam says, listen, the early Ashkenazi authorities, such as the Tosafot, they didn't even wait an hour between meat and milk. They would simply do B'kana Mazot. M'kanichim et ha'peh v'yadayim, they would wash out their mouth and their hands. And they would go on to have a coffee after their meat meal. That was the prevalent custom among all the rabbis of Ashkenaz until not so long ago. Coffee. Don't, uh, whatever, I, uh, dairy, I'm giving an example. <coughs> giving an example. And uh, along says the Ramaz, but the custom nowadays in Ashkenaz is that everybody waits one hour. Don't tell me the Dutch wait one hour, it's a yeah, nonsense, yeah. somebody made it up. It's a, maybe the Dutch still keep one hour, but this was the custom of all of Ashkenaz. And the Ramah says, but somebody who yesh boreach Torah has smells a little bit of Torah. He says the Medag the commentary says reach Torah. The Ramah says, somebody who even wants to be a little bit holier would wait six hours like the Shukhan Aruch, and that's what a person should do, and you should not change from this custom. So that's where it became an Ashkenazi custom to wait like the Saladim for six hours. What happened to the burp issue? I mean, if, if uh, the Rambam is more worried about meat in your teeth, and Rashi was interested in the burping, what happened to the burp issue? It seems like six hours is also enough time for your stomach yeah. to not be giving up flavor anymore. I think the problem is that things have become kind of arbitrary. Um, I told you I went to this kosher restaurant in New York, this pizza place, and it said right on the menu, do not eat dairy if you've had meat in the last six hours. For all Jews. This is so what do you see, though, from the Ramah? How ironclad is this halakha? For some of the there's not much to talk about. So I'm here for Ashkenazi. I mean, if, is there anywhere in Ashkenazi says, well, some rabbi said you can have pig if you salt it. I don't want to say, no, the pig has to be salted and pickled. No, it has to be salted and pickled. You don't find something, pig is not kosher. Here, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. From the way the Ramah speaks about it, you realize that this is not even a rabbinic prohibition. Right now, Rabbi told me that if he were to be rewriting the Shulchan Aruch today, he wouldn't even include this as a halakha. Which one? <coughs> Waiting between meat and milk. Waiting there at all. No, but, but he does. Don't worry. Don't jump on me. He does. He does. He does. How did I get to meat and milk? 
just trying to think. <laughs> You, you, you've been uh, reading daily a lot. Huh? You've been doing oh, is this what a sangha? Uh, the they know a series oh. on. So sometimes, oh, sometimes people can make a mistake when they know. So oh. now, let's go back to the ice cream oh, question. Right. Yeah. You're walking down the boardwalk. You made a shackle on the abdavol. You now said Hashem's name. If you don't eat ice cream, you have now said Hashem's name. <laughs> biblical, rabbinic, or a custom? Biblical. That's yeah. a biblical prohibition. So don't say Hashem's name today. Eating the ice cream an hour mm-hmm. after you had steak. Rabbinic. Biblical, rabbinic, or a custom? Rabbinic. Rabbinic. Maybe. Oh, a custom. Oh, custom. Maybe. In which case, of course, someone who knows halakha would say you have to, you have to, of course, you have to have a bit of the ice cream. A bit. It doesn't have to finish the ice cream. You just take a bit, you made a shackle, keep going. What you see here is that if a person does not sufficiently understand not just halakha, what you do, but the origins of the halakha, the weight of the halakha, what is biblical, what is rabbinic, what is... To the best of my knowledge, I don't know many, I don't know many rabbis who teach biblical, rabbinic, minhag, it's all kind of one big bush of, this is what Jews do, tradition, enter, uh, fill it on the roof song here. This is what most Judaism sounds like. <laughs> when it comes to halakhot, if you don't know, you'll be the person who makes that mistake of rather preferring to say Hashem's name in vain than eating, God forbid, meat and milk. But that's not the truth. The truth is that you're not actually eating meat and milk. And saying Hashem's name in vain is much worse. But how do you expect the person to know that if they don't know the halakhot properly? I'm going to push on this a step forward. Two halakhot after Ma'an mentions waiting six hours. Ma'an says, what happens if a person had tavshil shel basal? Tavshil shel basal, not like how some people want to translate it. It means a pyre of food cooked in a meat pot. That is not called tavshil shel basal. This is food that was cooked alongside meat in the same dish. Imagine here you made um, rice, vegetables, and chicken all in the same pan. Or, I'll give you a better example, chicken soup. Chicken soup, you have to listen to me when I'm telling you carefully. Clear chicken soup, not chicken soup that has little chicken pieces floating around. <coughs> For whatever reason, the chicken was removed from this chicken soup. Now you're having, I'll make a, you're having a carrot from that chicken soup. After you eat a carrot from that chicken soup, how long do you have to wait? Six hours. Six hours. Yeah, it's right, so it's flesh. I mean, that carrot became chicken, essentially. Yeah. Says Maran, it's not true. Someone who eats tafshil shal basala, someone who eats this carrot, or even the soup without any chicken in it. I, I use the carrot because the chicken soup example is harder than the, the carrot itself. That person can eat right away dairy or cheese. They just can't eat it. That carrot, you can't like put cheese on top of the carrot and eat it. That carrot is not meat and it's not dairy. Maran gives you a middle ground status. And it's called things that were cooked with meat or things that were cooked with dairy. You can't have a carrot that was on your lasagna that has no cheese on it. You can't eat that with chicken either. But there's a middle status. Oh, I see. And Maran says, this middle status are things the carrot cooked in the chicken soup cannot possibly make you wait six hours. I barely believe that the chicken makes you wait six hours. Now you also want me to wait six hours on the carrot? There's also an argument. When you, when you understand the origins of the halakha of waiting, all of a sudden you realize Maran is not so crazy. But Maran is saying, it's bad enough that I have to wait for the meat because that's already a halakha that we've accepted because that's what Jews do. But to now wait on the onions inside of the soup, to wait on the, just the broth of the soup that didn't have any chicken inside of it, that's already pushing it. The Ramah says, I'm sorry, I don't accept this. The Ramah says, how can you ensure that there's no fat that goes around the chicken soup and the fat is the same thing as the chicken? And the custom of the Jewish people is to wait after that chicken soup as well. And the Chida, Rabbi Chaim Yosef Zulai, who was the foremost Sephardic commentator in the Shavuot, says, and we shall never change our custom, we will wait six hours like the Ramah. <coughs> Isn't even chicken a different status than other meats? Not really. Not in halakha. People like to say it, but it, it's different. Obviously, in its origins, but in halakha, we treat it the same as meat. That's been established. Yeah, that's been established as the halakha. So now, what, what I'm telling you, uh, Pelot always loves to say, he knows all these people that won't have dairy after their chicken soup, but they'll cheat on their taxes. Or they'll only eat halavi sarat. Or they'll only, they have all kinds of things that they chose. Is, but this is not, Maran is telling you openly in the Shulchan Aruch, it is not meat. You can have afterwards dairy. So no. what, what's the uh, contemporary uh, take on this? Aside from her parents and his students? Aside. Myself yeah. included? Yeah. 
and nobody in the world would ever dare have dairy after such a thing. So would you? Of course. You would, mm -hmm. you would have dairy after I do, and then I would. I did it today, actually. Really? I'm camera. I'm going to lose my job somewhere. Oh. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. no, it's okay. It's no, okay. No, no, I'm, no. I'm not afraid. I'm not. The, the Benish Chaim. It's like not mixing chesed and gavura. Because meat is gavura, chalav is chesed. Okay. So what the matters of halacha, I just, we, we, the Benish Chaim would disagree, but we leave the Kabbalah on the side. I understand. Did you say that both Maran and Ramah say you have to wait six hours for both Ashkenazi no. and? Oh, uh, about in regular meat? Or about the carrot? No, but regular meat. Really? Yeah, both of them say six hours. So how come so many people wait three hours? Or when I went to ask our parents if I should change to six hours, because my parents do three. And when I asked my grandfather, he says, but we do six. And I asked my grandmother, she does six. So where did the three come from? Somewhere along the line. So I <laughs> asked her parents, and her parents <laughs> told me, you're already doing three. That's already long enough. You don't have to change. Because <laughs> the origins of this halakha are not strict enough that you have to change. But when people ask me what to do, I always tell them six. How can I rule halakha against Mala? You can't. So it goes. So Moran rules six. Six. Okay. Rabbi Vali Yosef is lenient and he says that five into the sixth hour, so five and a half is okay. But it doesn't help you. And and you get in half an hour. And he uses so reasoning? It's similar to this, but obviously much more strict. So if the family, I think I mentioned for if the family tradition is open for always two hours, you're going to hold by that also? I, mean, really I don't know. But when someone asked me a question, I once asked our parents, it's so long as somebody's what listen, you can't make up your own family tradition. But if someone has a tradition in their family that's a real, their parents were Yeresha Maim passed with tradition, even an hour is okay. The halakha, Ramah says that if a person is not feeling well and they for some reason have to eat dairy, uh, whatever reason, the doctor said they needed uh, whatever, so, or whatever. I don't, whatever the reason would be. An hour is sufficient for a sick person even who has a custom to wait six hours. And there are a lot of people in the world that the status of sick, I mean, all the people, I know half of the people here probably do this, they eat before they pray shachrit. Who do they rely on? They rely on one opinion that says that a sick person is allowed to eat before tefillah. So what's the definition of a sick person? Anybody who even just gets queasy at the thought of having to wait until after tefillah to eat. They, they get a headache if they don't have their food for breakfast. So if that's the definition of a sick person, so that should be the definition of a sick person over here also. Well, I don't agree with that definition of a sick person, but according to he who holds that opinion by Shacharit, so he'd have to explain to me why so that. So one is. opinion that is outweighing in most people's minds the opinion of any other Torah About what? About eating before tefillah? I don't think that your average Torah scholar would allow the eating before tefillah. You could have a, something to a drink. drink. A drink. You can have a drink. An apple. So an apple. An apple. An apple. An apple. A drink. There is a, it's a mistake. Uh, we pray so late whenever we finish so late and people are hungry. That's a mistake. Baruch, when you were in Israel this, uh, last week, Shabbat, what, morning, what time do they pray in the morning? Well, they start about 6.30. 6.30. What time do you get home? Uh, about 9. About 9? <laughs> what time do you eat? 9.01? <laughs> about 9.10. 9.10. Okay, so it, it makes sense for a person who wakes up at 6.30. At 9.10, they're waiting until 9.10 to have breakfast. But a person wakes up and they wait until 12 o'clock, 12.30. Some shows it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I, you're right. You can't. I, how can so I don't I don't push this halakha hard because I'm aware of this this problem. And how can I push somebody to? It's literally fasting for half a day. Fasting, yeah. It's it's a it's a real problem. And it says in the it says in the Talmud that he who doesn't eat bread in the morning has to face a thousand demons during. The day. Right, but their morning is relative to his waking up and his sleeping. And um, it's actually in this halakha. We're gonna get to. Yeah. Not in this chapter, it's in this chapter, in this section. That weekday was even easier. <laughs> what? Yeah. yeah they start about 6 a.m., <laughs> which is kind of late because I guess the days are still not real long yet. And then he says here, Uvvadai. <laughs> so, do you want to ask something? No. no. So, certainly, Shadif Lasot Ken, it's proper to do this, meaning to study halakha, practical halakha. Me'asher Lil Mod, instead of studying Talmud, Gemara. The Rishonim in the early sages, the Rashba, the Rif, the Ran, Rashi, tells me that Od Daf Hayomi, or to study the mm. page of the day, Mibli Ef Sharut Ladat Halacha Lamase, Mibli Ef Sharut without the possibility Ladat of knowing Halacha Lamase, the actual Halacha, the practical Halacha. And 
not for a deaf film. That, no, that should try to get him to do that film. I don't. It means there's a, if you study a page of Talmud a day, after seven and a half years, you'll finish the whole Talmud. And then what? Yeah. No, no. I'm not, my father finished the Talmud twice this way. But and then what? What happens then? So you finish the Talmud and. We're not sure. commanded to know the whole Talmud. We're commanded to know, to believe in Hashem, and to know how to follow Him. Half of the Talmud is irrelevant to either of those two topics. It doesn't help you connect Hashem. It's not a philosophical book. And two, it's not practical. There are no halachot that you're actually going to fulfill that are written in the Talmud. You're studying the tractate of offering sacrifices in the Temple Mount. What does it help you? If I have time my whole life to study Torah, so I have time to learn the things that are irrelevant also because I have a lot of time. But if I only have a certain amount of time to study Torah, then, then covering ground, you're not supposed to cover ground, but to understand what you're studying in Torah. And with the exception of perhaps my father, how many people remember what we studied last week? And we spent two hours on it, let alone you finish the whole page of Talmud in an hour, maybe 45 minutes sometimes. How much of it did we really internalize? I thought when you are getting smicha when you're studying that, it isn't based on tractates, like you have to master Baba Basra, for example, Baba Kama, or is it based on halacha? It's based on halachot. Because that's all I hear about, is that, okay, we're working on Baba Basra. I don't think you have to study Baba Basra anywhere to get smicha. It could be there, it's a new thing like that. I'm not familiar with it. The, like that book that you let me borrow, the uh, rab, uh, Rabbi uh, Uziel? Yeah. Yeah, he says like a rabbi needs to be somebody that can give any answer to any, or at least know where to find the answer in any question of halakha or, or anything like that. So like to master to master the Shulchan Aruch and to know that, it seems, he doesn't say to point him to what track to you or whatever. He's, he's is mainly about how to do something in a normal everyday life. This, this study of Gemara exclusively is something that was brought to us by the, not even all the Ashkenazi community, but the Lithuanian Ashkenazi community in particular. The German Jews did not study like that. The Hasidic Jews did not study like that. And in fact, the Hasidic Jews and the German Jews and the Sephardic Jews almost studied Torah the same way. And somehow the Lithuanian, you know Lithuania? Yeah. My wife always says, the Lithuania flag is a horse standing up in its back legs. So the reason it's on its back legs, if we put its front legs down, we would be in a different country. You know? Lithuania is a very small place. And somehow this approach managed to conquer the whole world of Torah to the point where people exclusively study Torah. Uh, tell them, that's what the people study. That's considered Torah learning. When it's, what you've told me, I have study partners, and I, I bump into them all the time when I'm in Israel. I visit, I mean people that learn with me in high school that... And I ask them, oh, so what are you learning? Uh, Bava Basra, yeah, they'll tell you, I'm Bava Basra, right? Great, and you ask them in Halachot, and they don't know what you're talking about. How, how was the, one of the rabbis say, we said in the beginning of Kolob, it was the Me'iri, but don't hold me to it. He says, I met Torah scholars, says, that are experts on all the rooms of the Talmud. They know every area of the Talmud, every, every room, every bedroom, every... He says, but you ask them about a Halacha question, he says, not only do they not know which room to go to, they don't even know how to open up the door. It's like a locked book. For them. How many times do you hear Rabbi? Oh, I'm not a post so I can't answer your question. Yeah. If you're not a post what are you? A post doesn't have to be a second everything. I'm also not a post second everything. But in what you studied, how do you not know? Well, the truth is, I didn't really study much for this. That's why I have what I have. That's a different problem in its own right. So, is a rabbi more ideally you know, a GP or a specialist <laughs> these days? Nowadays, he's, he's neither. He's like a online certified life coach. That's what he is. <laughs> no, that's the truth. I mean, if, if it would be either of them, I'd be happy. But it's neither of them. And that's, that's the, this is the problem. I had, like, I've sat at a table before where I listen to people talk about all these different, like, different halakha, like, oh, different things and things that they buy to keep certain things and whatever. And, like, and, like, excuse me if this is like rude or anything, but it's probably the most unspiritual conversation I've ever heard. And it was all about halacha. And because like, they were just talking about how to do these things and why, and and how strict, not even how strict they are. They weren't trying to brag. They were just literally just talking about how to do it. But like, I felt like I was, when I was listening to it all, I was like, where's, where's connecting to Hashem in all this? You know, and I'm not saying that, 
you don't by keeping halacha. I just think that um, there's like there needs to be a mix of, of both. Like you yeah, study. You're answering Zev's question. That is that Judaism in general used to be the field of general practitioners in the sense that it had to at least be wholesome. You had to at least have understood everything in order to zoom in on something. Today, what you have are people who are experts in halakha, but that's it. They don't know Talmud, they don't know Kabbalah, they don't know Tanakh, they don't know Mishnah, they don't know... And so their halakha is very dry and rigid because it, it has nothing else to it. There's nothing the else. There's, right, the context is missing. The essence. It, it, essence it could be. I mean, they're experts in what it says, but they, there's no big picture here. Rav Cook says that in this generation, what the nation is actually demanding from its teachers are not, it used to be the people that don't, don't confuse us with the details. There used to be an a attitude. Or, there used to be an attitude of, uh, uh, we only want to know the details. We don't care about the bigger picture. That was an exile. What can you do? You don't have a bigger picture. You don't have to focus on the details. And Rav Cook says that now what the generation is demanding from us is we're okay with the details and with the bigger picture, but we just need you to connect them for us. I get why I have to rest on Shabbat, and I understand that on Shabbat you don't make a cup of tea in the second hot cup or the third hot cup. But I don't understand why on earth the reason I keep Shabbat has anything to do with why I don't make tea on the second cup on Shabbat. And that's the task of the rabbis of this generation, is to connect the details with the bigger picture. It's not to ignore either of them. We had periods where we focused on the bigger picture or we focused on the smaller picture. Today the job is to connect those two dots and then the nation will be receptive to the Torah. Does that connection come through actual the Torah or is it? Some people, I've seen rabbis try to do that in a more metaphorical sense. They come up with something poetic or nice about it. How much weight does that actually have? Well, because it's done in a way that doesn't carry much weight. There are some Tamil Chamim who have... Imagine that article that you just read. I sent them an article about uh, the Rambo. What that article did is took a lot of things you already knew yeah. and connected the dots. And it wasn't like speculation or right. marshmallow fluff had, philosophy. Had it a was huge line of footnotes very, for everything. Very good. Source. The same thing with halakha. This oh, well, the reason why we don't do this is well, kabbalistically uh, uh, or spiritually. There's a lot of talk like this, a lot of fluff. That's not what Rav Cook means by connecting the dots. He means connecting the dots of a concrete reasoning that goes the whole way through. In which you know who was an expert in this? His name was the rugged chover gaon. He was not a yemen that rabbi. Uh, the rugged chover gaon, the gaon. The, you know, the Vilna Gaon? So he was the Gaon, the genius of Ragachev. Uh, we once looked at a picture of him. Rabbi mm-hmm. Yosef Rosen, I believe the name was. Mm-hmm. He had a lot of hair. Because mm-hmm. yeah. he never stopped studying until I had to get a haircut. So he, a he was the Lubavitcher <coughs> Rebbe's teacher. And I've asked people about that, they don't even know he was Lubavitcher Rebbe's teacher. <laughs> the Ragachev was so well respected that even though he was a Chabad Chassid, in the Lithuanian communities which hated Chabad, they made a point, until today, and you go to any Lithuanian yeshiva, everybody studies the Ragachavar's teachings. The Ragachavar has one purpose in his Torah, and that is to take seemingly non-connected ideas, unconnected ideas, mm-hmm. English, Un- yeah. Yeah. unrelated ideas, and show you how not only are they not unrelated, they are so related that how could you have possibly thought of studying one without the other? And he actually weaves this incredible net, it's like a, and you see it's only from a person you know, when I'm looking at the Torah from here, so I only see what's in front of me. It's like a tunnel vision. But when you have this bird's eye view of the Torah, all of a sudden you see, wait a second, hold on. It's not just that people fly in an airplane to Canada, people fly up to the Mississippi. It's all one big world that we're looking at, and everything connects, and there's a river. No? See, it's not that they have a Mississippi River over here, and they have another Mississippi River over there. It's one big Mississippi River. You see, you can see this when you zoom out, but you have to have that greatness to zoom out and still not to zoom it's in. It's not a reductionist. Exactly. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe, in one of his letters says that his life's purpose was to bring that attitude of Torah to his to his teachings. And in fact, I found it the most, more than the Ragachev, because the Ragachev was very difficult to understand. He was so brilliant that he he wasn't able to meet out ideas. They were kind of, they're very concentrated. So unless you know how to take that drop and put it in water, so it, 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 it's just very difficult to understand what he wants from your life. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, though, and if anyone's ever understood the brilliance of his teachings, is I'll take an idea, and another idea, and a third idea, and show you how it's all connected. Everything here is one one piece. And that's why some people who study his writings have a very hard time studying anything else. Because when you study other things that are not as interconnected, you feel like the person who's teaching you doesn't really get it. Because I've studied a Torah where everything is connected. And there's, there's a, there is a lot like this. I strongly suggest studying the Lubavitcher Rebbe. 
his writings, uh, put the Hasidus on the side, his writings on the parasha, the way he understands Rashi. Once I studied Bab Shabbat Rashi, I could never study Rashi alone again. And the way he understands Perkevot. Mm. He'll tell you, you know, this Mishnah means X. But the question that I have is not what it means, but rather, why did this rabbi, if he had one thing to tell the Jewish people, why is it that he chose to say this thing? Mm. There were years where I used to teach with Babacher and Perkevot. You may remember the older days. That's all they taught with Babacher and Perkevot. <clears throat> and his whole thing is to show you from the personality of the rabbi, from the history that we know about him, the biography that we have in, in the Talmud, and the other teachings that he has, this one snippet that you think is just a cute line in Perkevot is the culmination of everything he ever wanted to say in his life. It makes complete sense why Hillel said X and why Shammai said Y and why, why uh, uh, Rabbi Nittai Harbeli from Arbel said this. Uh, every one of them is saying something that is so profound, but I don't know that until the Lubavitch Rebbe wrote it that anybody else ever had that vision to see it. <laughs> and it's not just because they weren't great. There were people greater than Lubavitch Rebbe. Not that he's not great, but there were people greater than him. But also there's a generation. Your generation demands from you to speak a different kind of Torah. Like the Mkubalim. There was a generation where the Kabbalists just spoke to themselves, Kabbalah, because there was nobody to listen to. <laughs> and nobody cared. Nobody cared. And there was a generation which knocked down their doors and teach us what's going on here, because we don't like what we're hearing outside. And you see that those Kabbalists had a certain blessing to teach their teachings to the world. And that was, it wasn't just, were they more brilliant than that Rizal? No. <clears throat> But they had a different crowd. They had, there was a different spirit in the air that caused them to be able to teach this. The Chen Rawi is also proper. Lahim, for them. Shilmedu b'sifrei Musar. That they should study the writings of Musar. Musar means any work that makes you into a better human being. So, a person has two or three hours a day to study Torah. They should study... Practical, uh, practical, practical, I mean, things that are relevant yeah. to their lives, and uh, commentary, uh, study law and commentary. Yeah. Uh, so it's the Shukhanu, they can do either Shukhanu and his commentaries, or just another book of Anakha. And they should study, what's the last thing we just said? Musa. 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 What good is it to know Torah if you don't uh, become a better person? Let's see here, footnote Tetvav. It's in the Rashi script, so forgive me if it's hard to read. It's the second footnote in the right column. Chen Ketav Adrisha. The Drisha wrote something. So the Drisha is an Ashkenazi commentary on the Beit Yosef. Bizalashon. He writes these words. Yes, Bale Batim. There are people who are laymen. Nohagim Nuchmod Bechol Yom Gapat. What is Gapat? Gemara. Sounds, sounds like a Gemara. Prasha. Uh, very good. Perush Rashi. And? Tosafot. Tosafot. Very good. Very good. When we say Gapat, we mean the Talmud with Rashi and Tosafot, the commentaries <coughs> on them. The people have time to study two or three hours a day, and they study Gapat. Velosh al And they don't study anything else, not the writings of the other halachic authorities. Umeviim raya mehad amrinam benida, and they bring a proof from that which it is said in Nida, tractate Nida. Tanad Reliyahu. As we say this in Shabbat morning, it was taught in the house of study of Eliyahu Navi. Incredible. We have teachings from the Bede Midrash of Eliyahu Navi. <laughs> I'm telling you, guys, if you, if you look at Judaism, you will realize that the rest of the world is one beautiful counterfeit. Mm-hmm. Or at best, a really lousy plagiarism. But it's not even worth It's not even. The teachings of Eliyahu Navi. Anybody who studies halachot every day. He is guaranteed that he will be a, a person who will have a portion of the world to come. What are they using this halachah to say? How much halachah do you have to study a day? Two hours of Torah. Well, these are people who are only studying Talmud. So what are they using this teaching uh, to tell them? That, that you'll get a portion of the world to come. If you do what? Stay, Yishochana. How much? Kapat. 
But then look, as long as you study a halakha or two a day, you get into the world to come. <clears throat> That's all the halakha you have to study. Just one cloth. Yeah. It says anyone who studies halakhot, plural, two halakhot a day, gets into the next world. So I'll study Talmud the whole day, and I'll study two halakhot in the morning when I'm taking off my chili and chocolate. I get an email in my inbox. Study kapatari. So they put quantified <laughs> by the number of halakhot, not Correct. by time. Exactly. Right. Or, or seriousness of study. Just, just, and, and most of you should be able to do this. They have a little piece of paper that's been read, like two random halakhot for the day. Mm. Remember once it was like, the blessing on oatmeal is X, and the blessing on Cheerios is Y. Uh, that's it. That Those were my two halakhot a day. With ML, MLS, the last school I went to, they had every day, he would, today's halakha is, and then. Right, so this is where it comes from. They're trying to say, listen, you can spend your day studying all the other stuff in the world, but halakha will give you one or two snippets a day. And in the yeshiva world, that's the most halakha they study in the whole day. In, in some yeshivot, in some yeshivot. Even Lakewood? I don't know, I wasn't in Lakewood, but like, for example, in Baltimore. <coughs> in some classes, only for me, it was only in 12th grade. So let's say class starts at 9 in the morning until 1. So in 9 to 9.25, you know what happens at 9 to 9.25? Halakha. You study halakha. But what does it mean? What, what happens from 9 to 9.25? That's when everyone goes to get their second cup of coffee. Or that's the buffers. You have like this cushion zone of how late you can come to class. Cause so it's not it, serious. It's not the important stuff anyways. Uh, I remember days of just sitting there alone. Really? Yeah, nobody else, you know, nobody cares. It's like after Mincha, they give you 30 minutes to study Musar. You know what it means? Coffee. <laughs> Bathroom break. Very good. <laughs> It's three minutes, that's a great time to call your mom every day. Why? Because when you say, listen guys, all I need to do is 25 minutes of this, but 16 hours of Talmud, you're right. telling a person what is important and what is not. Yeah. And it's, it's meant well. It's meant like we want people to be well-rounded. So even though we focus on Talmud, we want to give them a little bit of something. Yeah. But that, so this is what's happening. They're saying, oh, you just have to study a little bit of Halakha day. Kim bezot it halel hasechet. Some person must be proud, not of that, the two halakhot they know, but that they actually know the laws of the Torah. Like setting the riff, Rabbi Yitzhak Al-Fasi. The Mordechai. The Mordechai is very big to the Ashkenazi community. He's one of the Rishonim. The Harosh and the Rosh, who is quoting the Shukhanuch all the time. And similar books to them. Because these are the roots and the main purpose of studying Torah is to know how to keep the Torah. He's not saying here study two laws a day. He's saying t- tackle halakha from its roots. And you see what people don't understand is when you tackle halakha from its roots, you inevitably study Tanakh because the roots of the halakha are in the Tanakh. You inevitably study the Mishnah because that's the next step. Is you go from the Tanakh to the Mishnah, and then you go to the Talmud. From the Talmud, you go to Rashi and Tosfot to the commentaries. And then you study Shulchan Aruch and its commentaries. And those who study halakha actually have a very well-rounded view of the Torah. But those who study Talmud, it's like people who. They only want to, and it's like a three-part course, they only want to study the middle one. They don't want to do the introduction, they don't want to do the conclusion, just the middle part. It's kind of, it's pretty silly when you think about it. You didn't start in the Tanakh, so this is not a divine learning. You didn't end in anything practical, so it's not useful for you. You just want to stick to this middle theoretical ground. What does it do for you? Why is it so widespread? Why is it everybody studying it? The same reason there are 1 billion Christians in the world and only 13 million Jews. The numbers just don't mean anything. Because Let people me, are, get, are used to see what other people do and they get used to it. And the genius Rabbi Nuzalman copied his language. And the genius Rabbi Nuzalman of Liadi, who was the first and the genius Rabbi Nuzalman of Liadi, who was the first Lubavitch Rebbe, he writes in his Shulchan Aruch, I would love for somebody to write that about my Rabbi, Shadam she'en lo p'nai that a person who doesn't have a lot of time in his day he must make sure that everything that he studies, all of his learning, would be belimud hadinim in the study of halakha, hamaviim the day which actually bring you to action, practical, relevant halachot. Sheim halachot hatzichot the kol adam ladatutam k'de lekeim hamitzvot shehem because they are the halachot that every person must need, they need to know in order to fulfill the mitzvot. This is what you need to know in order to make sure you don't stumble and make any mistakes. This is the person who has to know almost the entire Shukhan Aruch, the first volume, or Rachaim, that's what we're studying now. 
Ume'at Yoredea, and a little bit of Yoredea, there's some relevant halachot in Yoredea. Meaning, all of it is relevant, but most of them we rely on to Melech to learn them, and there's some that you need to know also. Ume'at Be'eben Ha'ezer, and some in the book of Ebn Ezer, of a Choshan and Mishpat, and there's a little bit of Choshan and Mishpat, but the main part that a person should know is I want to know Shukhan Ruchu Ha'chaim, backwards and forwards. And he brings a number of other commentaries that say the same exact thing, Rav Yonatan Eipshitz, the Gaon Milisa, Rav Chaim Palaji, so on and so forth, the Mishnah Bura, the Bach, the Tzafnat Paneach, that's the Raga Chavar, by the way. Um, and he brings his father here, two different places, where everybody says, says the same thing. What you see from here is a person must know Halakha, must. must. It's, I've never understood for the life of me. Why in the Jewish community the study of halakha is so lacking? When I mean study of halakha, I don't mean, can I do this on Shabbat or can I do that on Shabbat? I mean the true understanding of halakha. How does halakha work? What is the halakhic system? What is the origin of this halakha? So often I find myself sitting. See, when I come to somebody's house, at the Milchacham's house, not a somebody, and I see them do something, like, uh, for example, a Tamilcham were to come to my house and see me making a blessing before I wash my hands, mm-hmm. you know that I've never had a Tamilcham ask me why I do that? But I have always had a person who was a layman ask me why I do that. Yeah. The reason is that Tamil Chacham, he studied the Rambam and saw the Rambam says you have to make a blessing first. He knows the Shulchan says you have to make a blessing first. He knows the Talmud says you have to make a blessing first. And he knows that he has a custom to make a blessing afterwards. So he knows, listen, I know, I know what he's doing. I don't ask questions. It's the people who don't know. It's the sphere of the unknown. They start to ask, well, I don't know, it's kosher, it's this, I, I saw the rabbi, he makes a blessing for me, watch his hands, I've heard, I have heard this rumbling in my kitchen before. And these are the people who have no idea. 